welcome once again to Bleeding Edge Interviews, where we dig a little bit deeper into the minds of the amazing artists crafting today's progressive rock and metal. I'm your host, Super Dave, and thank you very much for joining me. I much appreciate it. When you talk about prog rock bands that have emerged in the 21st century, honestly, you'd be hard-pressed to name any held in higher regard than The Tangent. Over the past 20 plus years after their debut album, they are now set to release their 13th studio album entitled To Follow Polaris. Though saying they in this case is perhaps a little misleading. Now while the band has had many personnel changes over the years, the one constant fixture and mastermind really behind it all has always been founding member Andy Tillerson. And this time around, well, He's handled every aspect of the album production by himself. This is the tangent for one, he's called it. So this is definitely a first for him within the tangent and for the band, of course. So Andy was kind enough to spend some time with me talking about how the latest album came into being and the themes that inspired him this time around during its creation. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Andy Tillerson of the tangent well, well very good uh thank you very much for your time today sir i really appreciate you taking a little chance uh, a little time to sit down and chat with me a little bit that's uh no got worries. some exciting news with the new album coming out uh, to follow yeah. polaris that is due out you know i forgot to write down the date when is that due out next week it is uh or is it no no it's not next week it's, uh, it's uh, may the 10th so uh, may 10th. That, that's quite a way off actually uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah that's a, that's a good couple of weeks away so uh, yeah uh, I'm very cool more. so let's talk about the genesis of this album a little bit because in this particular case for uh, an album from the tangent this one is uh, i guess comparatively unique in the way it was recorded correct uh yes it's um it's a bit of a shake of the tree uh see what happens um but like uh, essentially uh well, you know tangents the way i make make my living and uh uh it came to a point where i i needed to work and unfortunately uh the rest of my band uh, were busy doing other things so i thought well we'll shake the tree and i'll go ahead and make an album under the name of the tangent that uh that i just work on myself yeah. um you know the tangent is you know more of a kind of musical idea than it that it ever has been a kind of coalesced band i mean we've had so many members over the years um the only uh the only common member to all of them is myself so uh hey um i did well where it is myself but uh you know it doesn't mean the end of the band it means that uh it's a one-off you know and so yeah. It's been very interesting to do, um, and uh, there's, um, you know, uh, it, it's definitely actually an album by the tangent. It feels like one. It sounds like one, and I and I think that when it, you know, if if it looks like a duck, you know, uh, and it walks like a duck, it probably is a duck. So this is a tangent record, yeah. Yeah, it, that's it's a very. I, I think in some ways I always think of uh, these projects where somebody maybe goes off and does something solo or somebody takes on this level of responsibility for themselves is that that idea of the double-edged sword, really. You know, you've got complete control, but there's there's upsides and downsides to that. I'm curious how you experienced it doing it this way. Uh, I, of course there are. I mean, um, and the biggest one of all is that... <laughs> when it when it comes down to it there is nobody to blame but me um and uh, so i think that um i think once i've gone into the once the project had been outlined in my own head i had I, I kind of had to build up a strategy of how to achieve what i wanted to achieve mm. uh, the negatives of course were that i didn't have much contact with people i didn't see my friends as much as i normally would um I spent an awful lot of time alone in this room and, uh, you know, which is uh, just uh, kind of like the little universe I live in and, and make the music here. Um, has to be said, there's an absolutely gorgeous view outside the window uh, <laughs> into the open and rolling countryside of North Yorkshire, but, um, you know, the sheep outside the window. Uh, and, uh, 
you know, it's just a, it's an inspiring place to work. So I got on with trying to be inspired and um, trying to make the very best record I could make on my own, you know, uh, of course, uh, there, are, there, there are difficulties that I came across and it was a question of, you know, okay, I've got the time. Nobody's putting pressure on me. Nobody's saying it's got to be ready now. Yeah. How can I just just kept on going until until I got something? I think I thought I could offer to the record company, and that's exactly what I did. And when they heard it, they decided to take it on. So right. there we go. You know, it's uh, uh, yes, naturally, you, you're so right. There's there's so many things that there are advantages and there's disadvantages. Yeah. <laughs> All the power and all the blame as well. Speaking yeah. of blame for a moment here, I don't know if it's coming through on your end, and I'll apologize to anybody watching or listening to this. Uh, unfortunately, there's street work going on out on my road, yeah. finally paving it, and I can hear the beeping every time the truck backs up. So I right, so that, I, was, yeah. I was wondering what that was. So that, yeah. yeah, I can only mm. filter it out so much where I'm mm. located because they are right on my corner at this moment. So I yeah. apologize to everybody for that. Uh, they were supposed to be done yesterday. Of course, they're not. So anyway, offering a bit of explanation, because it certainly sounds like your environment where you're at is much more serene than mine is at this particular moment. So I am envious of that as well. I, I love I love England. I love the UK. So Yorkshire oh. is not a place I've reached yet. So somewhere along the line, I've got to make sure I get there. You do. Yes. yes. Uh, it is. Um, it's, uh, I, I believe it to be the most beautiful part of England and certainly the most varied part of England. It's mm. a. It's a county that has a coastline and a very beautiful coastline. It has um, two lots of hills, one of which has small mountains in it. It's got a, got a huge, long, flat area. It's yeah. got industrial regions. It's got ancient regions. It's got history. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing little place. And it's only 100 miles across. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Anyway getting myself back on track. So with all that, all that preparation and all that expectation as you were going into this, how much in the end did the actuality of it compare to what you expected? I imagine there probably were things that came about along the, along the line that you were like, Oh wait, all right. Wasn't prepared for this. <laughs> um, well, I've always, you know, uh, um, how do I put this without sounding snotty? Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this a very long time. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I've been recording music um, and composing and putting recordings of music together since the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the 80s, I, uh, I operated and ran a, a commercial recording studio with tape recorders and everything in the center of Leeds in, in Yorkshire in England. Um, I got into the computer aspect of music on day one, 1985, put a computer in my recording studio and have been wow. using one ever since. Um, and uh, basically, I've, uh, I've been involved in so many albums. I've made 26 of my own composition albums and, uh, uh, and, and played on lots and lots of others. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, been a, it's been a lot. So basically... I know how to do it. Yeah. Um, it's just the fact that, uh, and I've even made records just myself before. Um, but this this one differs from that because it is part of the mainstream of my actual out there musical yeah. career, i.e., the tangent. And it's the first time I did it. I played instruments like the drums and the bass guitar. Um, and made sure I, I covered as much of it in the traditional way as possible. I wanted to be, I wanted the bass to sound like a real bass, and I wanted to put myself through the process of doing that. Yeah. Even now, it's an instrument I don't know how to play. But like I say, having all the experience of knowing how to record and how to make music, I had a very good head start because right. I didn't know how to play the instrument, but I knew what I wanted it to do. Yeah, and very clearly knew what I wanted it to do. So all there was a question of was sitting down with enough time and sitting right, okay, I want it to do this, and I, I'd make it do that. And I, if, it, if it took me two hours to play five notes, that was fine, you know, because I'd 
and just work at it because right, right. you know uh, I, I think that you know it's a case of I just I just designed it in my head and I knew how to to get the very best out of what I could do. Uh, my limited talent on the base was counteracted by an enormous amount of experience of having made records before. So that's yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. So as they say, this in many ways wasn't your first rodeo. And mm. no. in many ways too, how cool that after all this time, you you still had the opportunity to do something you hadn't done before in the studio. So I, I imagine that's... that's that was that was the great thing about it, you yeah. know. Um, this wasn't just normal. It wasn't run of the mill. It wasn't another one that came out of the sausage factory. It's just, yeah. you know, it was a completely new experience for me. And there's nothing wrong with having new experiences, is there? You know, sure. it's, yeah. What life's about a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you know, if if the opportunity or the need came about, this is something you probably would be willing to do again, right? If needs must, I would, yeah. yes. But, like, um, you know, uh, I, I do really enjoy collaborating with other people, uh, yeah. and, and I really value their contribution. I think that, you know, uh, if you just become yourself in isolation, it's not, it's, it's not really what I want from life. This once was great. And I'm not ruling out doing it again one day, but I'll just say that my personal preference is to work with other people and have that shared experience and friendship that goes along with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, and I guess your career speaks to that over the long term, because really, had you wanted to be a solo artist to begin with, you could have always done that. And, you know, could, yes, your choices I mean, in collaborating with people and working with a band says a lot about how you prefer to, to do that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you'll find that if you speak to most of the people I've worked with, they'll 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 stand up for me and say that I'm not a dictator. Mm. I actually offer them the music. I give yeah. them I give them my idea of how it should sound. I send it out to them as a fait accompli. Really, they yeah. there are already drums, there are already bass, and there's already guitar on the records when I send it to them, and. They are free to switch all my guitar parts off and start again, and from mm. scratch and devise their own. Same with bass, same with drums. Yeah. All I ask of them is that they keep the flavor of the song. You know, if the song's kind of got this nice sort of funky feel to it, that's what I wanted it to be. So yeah. Jonas doesn't necessarily have to play exactly the same bass line that I did. But if you play something that makes the song groove and improves it and keeps the feel that I wanted to be there, and that's it. And if I were to say nine times out of ten, that would be wrong. It's kind of 99 times out of 100, they get it right. And yeah. they do something that's absolutely great for me. I very, very rarely send anything back. I don't usually erase stuff or say I won't use that bit. If Luke sends parts in, they're on the album, you know, um, 99 times out of 100. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like a, a very smooth process you've got running at this point in time and, and very yeah. cool way of collaborating. It, it is a nice way of collaborating. I mean, yeah. obviously, the Tangent had a very, very uh, revolving door <laughs> process for the first 10 years, but the, the second yeah. 10 years have been about a similar group of people, myself, Jonas, Theo, and Luke. Um, and we added, uh, we added Steve, uh, back in 2017, which, which now of course is seven years ago. And, uh, yeah. wow. and, uh, and, uh, so, you know, he's a long-term member of the band and, uh, made three albums with us and, uh, and the live one. So, you know, um, that's it. We're the tangent. Yeah. Hmm? The way you describe it, it sounds like the typical, uh, recording process, creative process for you guys is is mostly remote. Then I, I guess you know you're shifting files back and forth and all that. That's pretty commonplace these days. Uh, yes, but uh, it wasn't when we started. I mean, yeah. like when we started in twenty in in two thousand and two is when we started recording our first album. Um, this is how we were working then. We started yeah. sending each other files. Um, 
And of course, uh, the internet was a bit a bit slower back then. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot I slower. And of course, we ended up sending each other thumb drives and, and CDs and things like that in the post. That was all involved in it. Right. But we didn't meet up, you know. Uh, yeah. We didn't meet up that often. And, you know, we've been distance recorders since the beginning. And, you know, one of the things that uh, not a lot of people realize is that we've done this 22-year-long career now. We've put out 13 albums. And in all that time, we've only hired a recording studio once. <laughs> and that was to record that was to record some drums for the fifth album, which was wow. in 2009. So since 2009, we haven't hired a recording studio. Everything's yeah. been done in our home studios <laughs> or in a rehearsal room where we've taken some gear, set it up, and recorded yeah. the drums. You know, so, you know, uh, that's... We've built up a long career on that and, you know, been signed to a fairly major label for all that time. So home recording, yeah. I mean, ask Boston. They made that wonderful album oh, years yeah. and years ago in a, in a recording studio they built themselves. And yeah. we've been following that example. Yeah. yeah. I, I imagine at some point in time, you've really got to make the, the job of producer <laughs> hard to find. <laughs> They're, they're becoming scarce, I imagine, but maybe not. Um, well, recording studios are, uh, you know, they're, they're, there's a place for them. Of course yeah. there is. There is a place for a recording studio. But I have this kind of way of looking at them now. When I, when I see a recording studio, I, I kind of think, gosh, look at all that space they're having to use. <laughs> you know? And to me, it's like when people talk about, the first Colossus computer, you know, mm. which was like rooms in size, you know, valves and huge control panels and tape things, and <laughs> uh, it and it occupied rooms full of. Uh, uh, that's how I kind of see recording studios. I mean, nowadays you can record a really good album um, on a train somewhere between London and uh, and and Leeds using a small laptop. And a keyboard, well, a, t a tiny little keyboard, and um, and it can all be carried in your backpack, and you can just set it up on the train and record something you could release, you know, to absolute that standard. So recording studios, they have their place, particularly if they want to record an orchestra or a, or a big choir or something like that. But for a rock band um, in the in the in the modern world, you know. No need. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Indeed. So getting away from the recording process a little bit, I, I'm curious about the lyrical content of the album, because I know your website, you described it as, and I'll paraphrase here a little bit, uh, highly optimistic and at the same time, highly critical of obstacles to that optimism. So I'm uh -huh. curious because the way you wrote it all out, it seems like, you know, your expectation is people think that, that tangent lyrics will tend to be a little more on the cynical side, but I'm curious where your inspirations were coming from in this particular go round. And, and if you can flesh out that idea of the optimism versus obstacles to optimism, as you I, see it. I think, uh, you know, I, I write songs that are usually essentially protest songs. Um, uh, and indeed that's what I consider myself to be. Number one, protest singer. Uh, number two, Perhaps I'm a frog musician. Yeah. So for me, the reason why I start doing all this is because I want to sing about the world I live in. And yeah. at the moment, and of course, most of my life, there's been an awful lot of problems with that world. And, uh, and, uh, that I want to be able to comment on, you know, some people do it in books, some people do it in films, some people do it in yeah. tweets, um, uh, or web pages, blogs. I guess my blog is is the tangent, and I write what I feel about the world in that, and I set it to music. Um, and I spend a lot of care in deciding what I want to say. Yeah. Um, and um, but you know, uh, I am not a person. Uh, you know, I'm a very kind of. Uh, I I am a very uh, optimistic person but I'm also a very realistic person. Mm. And uh, 
so I think when you end up in the net, when you're being too, when it, when things get too optimistic, you kind of get this, everything is beautiful, you know, sort of like kind of music, you know, yeah. it sort of sounds like the new Seekers back in the 1960s or something. And, uh, uh, you know, and I, I want to write songs that address modern problems. And I want to, uh, you know, have songs that sort of bring home terrible stories. Sure. But I also want to have this kind of guiding light, which is sort of um, something that's something that's uh, that we can aim for. This sort of brighter where you know, things could be better than they are. Let's see if we can do it. That's kind of that's kind of my message. It's a simple message, um, but. Um, and this is why I, I chose the title and chose the uh, 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 as Polaris. Yeah, because I was, you know, I was asking myself, "What's this record about, Andy? What am I looking for? What's what's what am I?" And I realised that this album, more than any other before, is about is an album that's in search of truth, um, and the idea of what truth is, because you know, since two thousand and sixteen. Truth has become something that's far, far, far less easy to put your finger on. Right. Because even if you know what's true, there's somebody else who knows that that isn't true. And that, of course, is crazy. Of course, we heard <laughs> the phrase, the, the post-truth era, and, yeah. um, and we've heard about alternative facts and all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, and I started wondering, is there anything anybody could agree on anymore? I mean, uh, because, uh, you know, shape of the world, for example, it's round. It's a, it's a planet. But <laughs> a load of people who, no matter what you show them from taken from space, will say, no, it's not. That's all faked by the deep state, by NASA. They are a government organization. The Earth is flat. It always has been. And... You know, and there's no way planes can fly around the world. Yes, <laughs> right. And you think, <laughs> how can anybody even present that in a way that 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 sounds anything other than a laugh? But they do, you know, yeah. because because it's okay. Uh, you know, there's it, you know these conspiracy theories, these mad scientific things that are, are completely untrue have just become part of day to day life. Um, I'm going to have to ask somebody to stop texting me in a second. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, this is um, – it, it's, a, it's a problem, and I, and, I, and I wanted to find something that, that everybody had to agree on, you know, right. and uh, I thought if we can find something like that, maybe you could sort of, like, use it as a, as a starting point to how we settle all these divisions we have on the earth and yeah. – uh, and eventually I found it. You know, I'm not a religious man. And, and, yeah. if I, and if I was, I'd just be part of one group of people who are opposed by another anyway. Um, sure. You know, because, like, you know, if I, if I tried to relate it all to God, there'd be some other wing of Christianity who said it was blasphemous, and there'd be another religion that said that their God did it better. Uh, you know, I, I can't deal with all that. Yeah. So, but I saw Polaris one night, one evening when I was walking with the dog. There it was, the flower in the sky. I think you call it the the, the source pan or something, whatever. Um, but uh, and you know, I followed the two stars, and Polaris is there. And then I realised, you know, that's the thing because you know that's always there in, in the North Sky, which of course is why the, there's a track called the North Sky on the album, and all the other stars appear to rotate around it, and. So it doesn't matter whether the Earth's flat or round. The North Star is there, and if you follow it, you will be going north. And if you and if and if you stand and look at it and leave a time lapse camera underneath it, all the rest of the firmament will 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 revolve around it. And uh, people have used it for navigation since before Galileo, and uh, and. Um, if they switched all the power off tomorrow and there was no electricity in the world um, and the internet didn't work and the GPS satellite switched off, you'd still be able to na navigate using Polaris all these years later. And 
you know, I, I've had a few songs where I've used the word uh, phrase GPS in it, you know, um, and so it really made a lot of sense to 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 right. to, uh, to to make the album follow Polaris. So in a world full of problems, you can just raise your eyes a little bit to the sky and see something we can all see, and we yeah. all know where it is, and we all uh, and we all have to agree <laughs> that it's there, <laughs> that it's not a deep state plot. <laughs> <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny. I can't think for some reason, and I don't know why I keep associating this particular phrasing with Stephen Wilson. But I just think back to somebody somewhere suggesting the idea that what if objective truth doesn't exist? That, and I think to a degree that makes sense because we've all got our own personal experiences and lives we've led and they've shaped everything for us. And yet, as you point out. There are things out there that really cannot be denied that are mm -hmm. are going to be objectively observed yeah. by everybody. That's it, and uh, and that's what I was looking for. Maybe something you know. Once you find something that everybody can agree on, you have a starting point, uh, and it doesn't matter if that's an obscure star billions of right. well millions of light years away from us. It it means that there's a, there's something there. There's something there that we all share, and I think that's a, that, that's where you know, in this crazy world that we're in at the moment, you need to find a starting point like that. I just happen to metaphorically choose a Polaris. That's all it is. I'm not saying in any way that Polaris <laughs> itself can make any difference to us. Sure, uh, just that it, it's done so much for us in the past, um, yeah. and. Uh, you know, aided the growth of our civilization and exploration and uh, everything. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, now that you've said all that, it, it's it's to me a pretty brilliant metaphor that I was not picking up on initially with listening to the album. So like, wow, okay. So that yeah. is a couple levels beyond the thinking I had there uh, oh, in terms my. of where you got the title. So I, I love that description and I and I love the idea that, you know, as you were talking as well, the idea of being perhaps say, we'll say displeased with the state of the world in some ways. And at the same time, wanting to craft a message that talks about, well, let's start finding solutions and, and maybe offering some ideas of how we can connect. Uh, you know, yeah, to me, think... as, as someone that's worked in a management position at times, you know, it's, it's yeah. easy enough for people to complain about the way things are. But if, if you have no suggestions for change, then it's really just complaining, isn't it? That's right. And uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, I, I question that whole process that you've just put, just mentioned there, that it's, is it just complaining, I ask myself. And yeah. that's very much the subject of the second song on the album, I Like in the Darkness, where I'm asking the question, I say all this, but is anybody going to listen? Will it make any difference to anybody who's suffering in the world through wars, through uh, through crime, through uh, a, a bigotry, through racism, through sexism, homophobia, all those things? Is there anything that my music can say that will help that? And, of course, the answer is, you know, in it, uh, to a cynic, the answer is no, it can't. But all, all I think of is if I can be part of a group of people, of many, many, many other people who, who deliver messages like this, whether that's in art, whether it's just in day-to-day -day conversation, whether it's from a pulpit in a church or a, or a podium in a synagogue, it doesn't matter. The fact is, is that if there's a lot of people saying things like this, the world genuinely can be a better place. So I just become a tiny little grain of sand on a big beach. That's what I'm yeah. hoping. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. It, it's, and, and I think it all ties in very nicely. It's reading again through your, your website and it's kind of interesting thing to back to back. I've been talking with people who, unlike a lot of artists who are often a bit circumspect about how they express their social and political views for fear of alienating fans and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Both of you back to back now, very upfront and very, very candid and about how they feel about things, about what their thoughts are, uh, the world at large and, and kind of uh, how they view society. And, and it's I'm appreciative of that. It, it's unusual to hear 
when you may be working in a field where there might be concern that you don't want to limit your audience? I think that's a, a very interesting question. And I can, we, uh, can only try to explain it in the, you know, in the end, uh, I guess that I'm so independent and I've, uh, and the, there's, you know, there's no shareholders <laughs> who are who are saying, "Oh, you can't do that, Andy." Yeah. Uh, there's 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 nothing like that. You know, I'm a I can choose to do what I do, and basically, I think yes, there are there are a number of things I've done over the years, not just the political or the social commentary that have meant that the tangent has not performed very well on on a on a on a stock market scale you know <laughs> um the tangent the tangent has done well in terms of of the critical response and the way it's uh, the way it's been so supported for all this time by by our record company but um you know so when i started to 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 bring more social commentary into the music i was aware that there will be some people who switch off and I was also aware that me being the lead vocalist of the band was also a uh, something that would put people up. Now, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I personally, I don't think I'm a particularly great singer. Some people think I am a good singer, and some people think I'm not. But the fact is, no matter whether they like it or not, I have not got the kind of voice that sells millions of records because people like listening to the voice, and. If, for example, I decided I need to go out and find somebody who sounds more like Neil Morse, yeah, then undoubtedly my band would have been more successful. But I took the decision to remain the band singer because I wanted to be, I wanted to be responsible for my own words. And if I was going to be the lyricist within the band, I thought the best person to deliver those lyrics is the person who wrote them, and. That's because, uh, you, you know, when you people forget that when you're singing, you're still speaking. You just you're just singing. You're just speaking with a tune, you know. Yeah. And I and I wanted the tangent to be my voice, you know. Um, and uh, and and I wanted it to be me saying the words. Um, so yeah, you, you make these decisions. There's got to be compromises. Sure. Um, the world is about to be hit by perfect music for for everybody. One day, you know, it's going to happen very soon. That there'll be, you know, <laughs> uh, there'll be absolutely perfect, magnificent sounding vocals over magnificent <laughs> sounding, perfectly produced tracks and everything. And it's coming. You know, that is going to happen. And there's nothing we can do to stop it. And people are going to love it. This, uh, but. Uh, here at the end of our era, um, I still want to make music that came out of my mouth and uh, sure. came out of my head, and uh, will continue to do so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fascinating thought when you say that too, because I'm I'm presuming you're referencing you know AI, the future, as it will start to just generate exactly what people want. Of course, and, absolutely. And, I mean, yeah. you know, and, and how 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 can that possibly fail? You know. Yeah. Uh, mm. I mean, it's uh, you know the the old story about the uh, they found that pleasure sensor in a yeah. in, in your brain, and they put some mice in a thing and and worked out a way of um, of uh, of stimulating the pleasure cortex, whichever whatever it's called. I'm afraid I don't know the, the scientific term, but they stimulated it to give it pleasure, and yeah. all there was was a there was a button at the end of the. Uh, there was a button at the end of the box, and when they pressed the button, they got 100% pure, unwatered down pleasure. You know, we're talking, you know, be better than the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so basically, as soon as they did it, they uh, they put the they put the mouse in there, spent a bit of time looking around, thinking, "Where am I?" And then thought, "What happens if I press this button?" And it pressed the button, and it pressed the button, and it pressed the button, and pressed the button, and it pressed the button until it died. Because right. it died of starvation, even though there was food right behind it, because right. it was so happy pressing this button. And we're like that, you know. 
<laughs> it comes along and makes us happy, we'll take it. You know, I mean, we, look how quickly we we all says, oh, Spotify, wonderful. The entire world of music, $10 a month, and we can hear anything we want. We never have to buy another record again. All we have to do is spend $10 a month. Nobody ever thought, what's that going to do to musicians now? Yeah. And everybody's thinking, I don't care. I've got Fleetwood Mac on loop, and you know, <laughs> and, and I can hear Taylor Swift, and I can hear this, that, and the other, and it's only $10 a month. And you say, well, what about the new guys? Oh, I've got yeah. so much. Who needs the new guys? <laughs> you know, so. Wow. Yeah. I think that's uh, I had I had not carried that thought that far in my head is what you just described. <laughs> so you're right. That geez, that's a little scary. <laughs> that, but, but, you know, that we, we'll be button pushing mice someday. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid that uh, you know, uh I've watched I've watched too many science fiction films, I probably <laughs> have to say, but you know, uh, I think there's a you know, there's a, there's an awful lot of things that uh, that will come, and that uh, yeah. another age will be responsible for sorting out and everything. Um, and our generation, um, uh, which uh, which might, I think I think I think you're probably I, I don't know how old you are, my friend. How how old are you? Fifty five. Fifty five. So you're kind of in my ballpark. I'm ten yeah. years older than you, uh, but like. Um, you know, we've been through a lot, and you remember life before the internet. I remember yeah. life before the internet. You can probably even remember life before video cassette recorders, and uh, so I can. Um, you know, nobody invented a video till I was about seventeen years old. You know, that's the first time I saw one. So we've lived through an awful lot, and I've lived half my life without the internet, half of my life with. You yeah. know. And, you know, I think on my first holiday, we went on holiday and we went on a steam train, you know. So <laughs> that's a big change between then and now. Uh, yeah. And since then, they've landed on the moon, had several wars, one in Vietnam, at least one in the Falklands. There's been all over the world. There's another one going on in Russia. There's another one going on in the Middle East. And, you know, uh, it's uh, it's just a... We just deal with these things as they come along, and uh, AI will be another thing that that uh, people have to deal with in the future. And yep. uh, I hope they can make something good of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen enough science fiction movies myself as well. Yeah, <laughs> we might get something good for a little while, and then the something good will become sentient, and then we've got problems. <laughs> uh, well, it, it, but it depends. You see, that that's the the the, the nightmare of Terminator, of course, is yeah, it becomes. Right. It becomes uh, it becomes sentient, and immediately decides that we all have to go because you know it's it's a. But what happens if it became sentient and thought, "I'm lonely. I need a friend." Yeah, <laughs> yeah we could well, be a good friend to it. We have no idea, have we? It's yeah. just uh, it's all speculation, and uh, yeah. you know. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion that if at some point in time it, it has to be this way, as long as they treat me well, I am more than prepared to become a pet to some machine overlord. A machine overlord? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. As long as you treat you well, I guess. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As long as they're good. I, I, I'm fine with being a pet. I see how the cat lives. I, you know, I think I could handle that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got a pet goose at the moment. So. Oh, no. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> just, just for a while. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's staying with me for a bit. So, right. just wild one that took up residence in your property, or yes, I, I found yeah. it the other day actually. Yeah. And, uh, um, oh, uh, nice. So it's just living downstairs. It's only a very small goose at the moment, so right. uh, it will become a bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> very so cool. I'm going to meet some other geese next week. See if it gets on with them. So, fingers <laughs> crossed. So I'm curious now that this is uh, now that this album is done. What are what are the next what are your next plans? What's next step? Next plans. Uh, I've already started the next uh, album by the tangent. I've started another project. Uh, you know, I'm a busy guy. Uh, yeah. I, I like to keep working. I like to make the most of what I've got left. And um, you know, uh, so there's another tangent album in the offing. Um, wow. A lot of it's already written. This next one's been designed to have the whole band on it, and. Uh, a bit more orchestra on it again this time so uh we're um it's going to be quite a conceptual one this one so and that's going to be about our generation it's going to be a whole album about you know 
the people who went from steam engines to chat GPT in one lifetime, oh, you know, and, uh, and a lot of the things we've lived through. So there'll be a lot of nostalgia, but there'll be a lot of commentary on it. And, you know, the cool. uh, you know, fact is, you know, one of the things that I'll be talking about is the fact that, uh, you know, I discovered a lot of the bands I like to listen to, like Hendrix and the doors and stuff like that back in the in the 1970s and i discovered them in a nice little suburban area you call them uh, subdivisions don't you um yeah, yeah. You know, in, in a nice subdivision in in leaves leaves trees lovely place you know quite posh and Wonderful. uh you know and, and there were other people discovering exactly the same songs in vietnam you know yeah, uh yeah. Whilst they were fighting these battles and everything, and of course, I never realised. I just thought, oh, yeah, this music's yeah, beautiful. It's part of my life, the soundtrack of my life. Well, it was a soundtrack of other people's lives, and their their lives were a bit more uh, frightening than mine, you know. Yeah. So I want to somehow get in the, you know, the the different ways we experienced growing up in these times. You know, they were very very different for an awful lot of people, and my experience is nothing compared to some people's experience. Right. Mm. Yeah, it becomes mind-boggling to try to imagine somebody else's life because we've only got our own perspective to, to look at it through and, and to start to imagine the myriad differences. Yeah, of course. I mean, like, you know, I would be listening to, uh, I would be listening to, uh, yeah, Riders on the Storm by the Doors and wondering what mum was making for tea in the kitchen and uh, whether, whether the dog needed a walk. And somebody else had been listening to Riders on the Storm and, you know, wondering whether wh whether somebody had loaded up the napalm shells or was going to be in a helicopter tonight or whether there was going to be a raid. And you're kind of thinking that was happening at the same time as I had all those memories. Right. You know, so that's that's what I want the record to look at. So, wow. That's a little preview. <laughs> yeah. Sounds amazing. <laughs> Very cool. And I, I nearly let slip. I got one more question for you. I needed to ask. Uh, the title, T at Betty's Simulation. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> it caught me one great, great uh, jazzy little tune and all that kind of stuff, but funky, everything like that. It's a great, great mix. But the title, <laughs> thinking, well, is there is a story behind that. Yes. It's, uh, I mean, Betty's is a, is a, is a, is a well known Northern English chain of little restaurants. <laughs> and they're usually, you know, you don't go there for a meal particularly. You go there to have afternoon tea. It's very, yeah. very English. And uh, you have scones and, uh, and plates full of cakes. And, and it's all served in a very, very antiquated and, and lovely, lovely old English way. Uh, it's a terribly English tradition. Yeah. Um, it's actually quite nice when you go. And it's ludicrously expensive. Oh. So you uh, you go there and you have this. And, and often they have a little... They have a little uh, either a piano player or they might have a trio if it's a busy day, uh, a little jazz trio playing, you know, ambient loud music in the background. And I just sort of like thought I I'd been there one day and I just imagined this scenario where they're just playing away. And one day they all got bored and started playing jazz fusion metal <laughs> uh, and everything. Um, and I just imagined what would happen. Uh, and then I kind of thought, well, nobody ever takes any any notice of musicians anyway, so they'd probably just keep on eating. <laughs> <laughs> but you can hear that sort of like this band has been playing the typical lounge music for five minutes, and then they get bored and just go off. And the, by the by the middle of it, they're playing thrash metal. Then they're playing <laughs> and then they're playing jungle R and B kind of stuff. And then they do some twentieth century classical, and then come back on. And all the ever gets is polite applause. <laughs> That was it. I just—it was just a little joke with myself, and it ended up as a bonus track on the album. That's all. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a great little bonus track, and I, and I love the story behind it. I, I next time I'm over there, I'm going to probably have to try and find one of these and see whether I can afford to get in. But yeah, maybe I'll make room for one way or the other. Be in the north of England. You'd need north to be of England. In, all right. Yeah, they don't have them down south. That particular chain, but uh, yeah. Very, so, cool. very Yeah. Excellent. Well. It, it's been my distinct pleasure, Andy, to talk with you today. I, I've really enjoyed it, um, oh, I, and I really appreciate you giving me the time. I I hope the album's a big, big success. You know, so do and, I. And <laughs> for, for, for those that ha you know, obviously, some of us have had a preview opportunity, but it's really a great album. I'm really enjoying it, and I, uh, you know, I no, thank hope, you. Very uh, much. 
everybody else is paying attention and, and gets on board with that when it comes out because it's it's absolutely uh, it's been a great couple of years for Prague and and this is just another example of it. Well, that's very kind of you to say so, and I'm I'm glad you did. Yeah, many thanks for that, and uh, and thank you for being one of the people who sits between us and the audience and tells people about us. You know, because people like yourself, we need you real big. Uh, so. Um, we appreciate it very much. I know a lot of us don't don't say so, but we do. <laughs> well, uh, certainly, I, one of the things I love is I, I've always enjoyed talking about uh, talking with musicians about what they do. I'm, I've been a long term musician wannabe, <laughs> so you know, as, as the observer and the uh, the the enjoyer of it, I guess of looking for there's certainly a better word. I, I speak for a living, but I didn't come up with it in that moment, but. Certainly, as an appreciator of the art, it's always fun to talk to people about what they do. Yeah, I think it's a, and it's a good thing, you know. Yeah. As I say, it's like a, a translator sometimes. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much again, sir. I wish you the best. Take care, thank and uh, hey, enjoy the last snow of spring. I hope. <laughs> yes, yeah, so do I. <laughs> All right. Very good. All right, Take my care. friend. Very best wishes, and thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> A lovely conversation and a true gentleman, of course. Andy really is such a, a such an insightful and talented artist, and and the depth of thought with which he approaches his music to me is an inspiration. Now, once again, the album is to follow Polaris. It's due to be released May tenth, and it is currently available for pre order. Uh, for your convenience, I put a link to the band's website in the description below. So let me tell you, honestly, it's it's really an inventive and enjoyable album. Uh, I'm digging it so far and uh, been lucky enough to hear it ahead of time, so that's always cool. But anyway, just another in what seems to be an unbroken stream of great prog music coming out this year. 2024 has been a bonanza. Uh, 2023 was pretty much too, so Andy doing his part to continue that <laughs> is, is that trend. It's, it's amazing. But uh, once again, uh, my thanks out to Andy Tillerson for joining me. Andy, it was a distinct pleasure chatting with you, sir. Best wishes for you and for the band and really for much success with the album. You, you got something really special this time around here. Uh, also, many thanks to the listeners and the viewers for joining me and for supporting the show. Couldn't do it without you guys. Uh, if you could take a moment, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe. I would be truly grateful. Uh, don't forget that the social media links are in the description if you want to follow me there. Also, don't forget to check out The Expanse on Live 365. That's my station dedicated to everything Prague. And the Brain Salad Sunday is coming up soon, which means nothing but 60s and 70s classic Prague, the roots of all this wonderful progressive music we get to hear these days. Once again, I leave you and remind you, never fear to deviate from the norm. Keep it proggy. And this is Super Dave, signing off. Oh,